Hello and welcome to, today, to today's webinar, Camelot with Inventor. This webinar is brought to you by Live Lab Learning, which is a part of Academic Corp, a wholly owned applied software company created to provide world-class training. My name is Patrick Musa and I am delighted to be your moderator today. Throughout our presentation, we encourage you to interact with us by typing questions and comments using the question pane on the right-hand side of your monitor. We'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation, and certainly if you have anything that comes up, we can see if we can uh, get, your, get your questions facilitated during the presentation as well. Um, throughout our presentation, I'm sorry, this webinar is uh, being recorded and will be available to you online through our YouTube channel. Um, I want to introduce our presenter. Again, this is Patrick Muse. I work with Applied Software. We're a platinum reseller of Autodesk products, and we partner with D3 in order to affect efficiently provide needs to your CAM and CNC world. We are able to assist you in building an efficient workflow that maximizes your software. If you would, please join me in welcoming Nick Narzinski as our main pre presenter today. Nick? Thank you, Patrick. Yep, so today my name is Nick Narzinski with D3 Technologies. We work with uh, Patrick Musa. And so today we're going to go over Autodesk CAM. So it actually comes from three different platforms of CAD, so Inventor, uh, Fusion, or it can also plug into SOLIDWORKS, but today we're going to be working with the Inventor side of the software. So first thing I'm going to do is just go through a PowerPoint presentation that covers, I get over here. we're going to go over the CNC user profile, so who our audience is, who we work with, just a quick overview of CNC, then we'll look at some configurations and fundamentals of the software and machinery. And then finally, we'll get into a demonstration of the Inventor HSM software. So who are, who's our audience? Who do we typically work with? We have managers who are looking to stream flow the design, so kind of bridge the gap between their designers, CNC programmers, and CNC operators. So with the HSM software, with it being integrated, you know, we're working with one piece of software when there's no longer two different CAD and CAM platforms where you have an import and export. Um, engineers and designers will be using it for designing parts. CNC programmers will be using it to program those parts and create fixtures and that setup. Um, and then we have our operators who will create fixtures for the part setups as well as creating setup code or setup sheets and, and uh, clean up the code. So what is CNC? stands for computer numerical control. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. It's a very precise and powerful uh, machinery. It runs off of G-code. There's a constant flow of information in there. Very precise tolerances and easily to re repeat jobs over and over again. So here's a typical modern CNC machine. This one here is a five-axis um, Haas mill. So I'll kind of break down the axes for this machine in our next couple slides. So with the software, we're, we're going to have a model work coordinate system, and we're going to have a, another work coordinate system for our programming. So it's all going to run off of X, Y, and Z, and rotation about each of those axes is A, B, and C. And you can remember that by X, Y, Z is A, B, C, and those go by red, green, blue. So a couple of key elements to CNC equipment. We have our spindle, which is where our cutting is, and we have the positioning system. A lot of times it's on the table for the X and Y, but it can be in the Z as well. Here's just a couple machining center examples for milling. We have our three axis, so we move in X and Y, positive and negative, and then our Z, positive and negative on the spindle or the column. On five axis machines, we would have our um, rotation on the Z axis for the spindle, then we'd have our X and Y positioning for the table, but then we'd also throw in a couple more rotation axes for either the A or B and the Z, or A, B, or C. So once we program our parts and we run through the post-processor, we're going to end up with similar language to this, which is G-code. So we're going to take that G-code, load it onto the CNC equipment, and that's going to program or tell the machine how and where to cut the parts. And how that information is handled, so we load it into the controller. It's going to send a signal to the server motor. The server motor then is going to make its table motions or rotations, and then it's going to send position feedback right back to the controller. So it's just kind of a constant flow of information through that controller and the servo. 
So this slide is for our machining complexity. We're just going to take a look at the different types of parts we can do and then which packages of the software that works with. So we have our HSM Express software, which is 2.5D uh, milling. I get questions all the time, what is 2.5 axis? 2.5 axis, it really is 3 axis, but what we're working at certain planes. So like in this picture here, we have a couple pockets there, and we have a flat top on the part. We come down in the Z to that plane, and we cut out. We could do simple movements like helix down to the bottom of a pocket or ramp at an angle around the part. But other than that, we're not, we're not able to do contoured profiles or anything with two and a half axis. So that is the HSM Express package. Then the next step up from there is Inventor HSM, which then we get into the 3D milling. So with 3D milling, we're able to do contoured parts like shown here. And I'll get into the major differences between the 3D profiles and the 2D profiles when we get into the software. But I just wanted you to see the different types of parts that these packages can handle. Now with the 3D package, we can also do what we call 3 plus 2. So 3 plus 2 would be like your tombstone milling. Um, you're, you're working with 3D profiles, but only like on a tombstone, you rotate the part and then you're cutting. You rotate the part and then you're cutting. It's not four axes simultaneously, but we're able to use four axes. So the, working with three, you do your rotation on one of those, and then you're working again. Then the last option is uh, the Inventor HSM Pro package, which comes with Inventor HSM Professional, and that package has five axis milling. So that one you could do four or five simultaneous axis cutting. So here's just a couple rundown on our terms for the software. So we got our speeds and feeds. Um, speed would be the rotation of the spindle. Your feed is how fast you're uh, cutting through the material. And then our step over is how much of stock that, that cutter is engaged with the, with the material. With the software, most of the operations we're able to uh, program with climb or conventional milling. Just kind of a quick rundown on climb versus conventional. You typically come out with a better surface finish with climb milling. The reason for that, if you, if you see in this picture, where our flute makes contact with the material as it's cutting through would be the thickest point of the chip. As it circles around and comes off the part, that is the thinnest point. So with that, the deflection is that it's minimal versus conventional milling. We start at the thinnest point and end the flute releases the chip at the thickest part. So that would be the most deflection and give us um, just a little bit less of a nicer uh, surface finish from climb milling. And with that, we're also able to integrate cutter compensation. Um, I saw before we even got started, one gentleman had a question about posting out G41 and 42 codes. The software does handle that with cutter compensation. Um, so here's just kind of a image of the three different packages. We have Inventor HSM, HSM Works, and SolidWorks, and then at the top we have the Fusion with uh, Fusion 360 with the CAM software. Nick? Yes. Hey, uh, quick, I have two questions right now. Um, I guess we can answer this one real quick since you just went over it. Um, it's from Josh Limke. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right. He, said, he asks, uh, what solution do you have, if any, for milling and turn? For, for milling and, and what? Turn. Oh, for turning? Mm hmm Turning is currently available. Let me just back up there. Turning is currently available in the HSM Works package. I think it's the right slide. Turning is currently available in the HSM Works package. Inventor HSM is up to parity and the milling side with HSM Works. And so just a little background on the software. It actually was developed in SOLIDWORKS like six years ago. All of us bought it about two years ago and it immediately started developing it into Inventor. And they did a great job of it, matching it to the interface, and we'll see that here in a little bit. So one of the things they did was got the milling up to, up to parity with SOLIDWORKS, and then they looked at SOLIDWORKS turning and listened to the customers, and they, they didn't really like the way turning was working in SOLIDWORKS. So Autodesk went back to the drawing board, uh, hired some more people for the development side, and they said, we're going to redo turning completely. We want it to 
to work right the first time we implemented it into Inventor. So they've been working on that over the last year, and they are pretty excited to release it with the release of Inventor 2016, which should come out by the end of this month. So turning as of today is not available. Come April, you will see turning in the Inventor HSM package. So great question there. And then I have one more from Mike Reiser. Um, I, he asked, can the code output G41, G42 cutter left or right on contours? Yep. Yeah, that's, that was what I was just talking about. So we will see that once we get into the demo, but you can uh, turn cutter comp on for almost all the operations. And with that, it'll post out your G41, 42 code. So good questions. Perfect. And that's all for right now. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, so this next slide is just kind of a Y integrated CAM. Uh, we cut down learning because we're using the same interface for both by 90%. It shortens up the setup time by approximately 75% because we're able to do that in the modeling program. If you guys have the same fixture that you're using over and over again or the mill, as you'll see in my example here, we can have that starting out with and just drop our parts in and program off that. And we are simplifying the process because we have that CAD and CAM in one environment. So. Um, we'll see here in the next or a few slides here where we actually cut out some steps in the process of you know doing rework or reprogramming and with the integrated solution. So what is the CAM process in our integrated solution? We have the model that we're going to start with, so we create a solid model, and Inventor is a great translator, so we can you know if a customer sends us a 3D file, we can import that as well. It doesn't have to be um, done inside of Inventor. You can import step files or I just files as well, as long as it's a solid model. Then we're going to do the CAM portion. We're going to create those tool paths, create our stock setup, generate those and verify them, make sure it was simulation so we can test our machining before we even send it out to our CNC equipment. Then we're going to post that out. So we're going to post it out with the G code. There's a bunch of different post processors the software comes with to match your machining language. And then we're going to run the G-code on the CNC machine. So here's just kind of some screenshots of that, create the CAD data, define the job setup, define our operations, verify those with simulation, and then post the code out. And you can see there's a nice G-code editor that the software comes with as well. Some of you might recognize it as Simco editor. So this is where we get into the differences between separated CAD CAM process and integrated CAD CAM. So with separated, this top row represents the first, you know, run through of setting it up, and then the second row would be if, you know, a customer called up and wanted to make changes. You could see it would be the exact same for both. So you'd start out with a CAD data, you'd export that CAD into a format your CAM system can accept, you'd import that, then you'd define your job setup, your operations, generate the tool path for those, verified tool path and post the code. If a customer calls up or you get to the machine that you decide you want to make changes, you have to run through that whole process again. You have to change the CAD data in your CAD software, re-export and import that into your CAM software, and run through, redefine the job setup, redefine the operations, generate the tool path, verify, and post. With the integrated solution, it's all one environment, all one file, so it makes our data management a lot easier as well. We create that CAD data. Define the job setup and operations, our tool path, and post the code all in one environment. If we need to make changes to that, we can simply make our changes right on the CAD data inside the environment we're working in. And all we have to do is regenerate the tool path. There's no having to go in there and reattach those as long as you're not adding or removing features or changing sizes or things of that nature. We can just save the CAD data and it's going to automatically update our uh, operations. So here's just some testimonials from customers, um, improve customer experience, provide quality solutions, we shorten our startup time, it's, there are process, post processors are very easy to use and very easy to edit, uh, lower cost of ownership because we have CAD and CAM in one place, and they really did make the software intuitive and easy to learn. So here's uh, some phone numbers and email addresses for Patrick and I. I'll just leave that up for a second. You guys can jot that down if you need to get in touch with us afterwards. And now we're going to take a quick look at the software. 
Any questions pop up, Patrick, before I get started? Okay. No, sorry, the mute button was goofed up on me there, but no, we are still <laughs> good. <laughs> good deal, good deal. Okay, so here is, you can see here we have a fixture and we have a part file placed in there two times. So we'd have one job set up for the top of the part, then once that was done, you'd flip it over and we'd face off the bottom side and, and machine up that pocket there. So each time you do a job setup in the machine, we would do a different job setup in the software. So with this being integrated, you can see here, those of you who are familiar with Inventor, we have an assembly file, and then down here we have the part file in there twice. And then the vice is just dropped in there. You can download a lot of the fixtures right off the customer's website nowadays. And if not, you can usually call them up and they'll send you those files as well. So first thing we're going to do is get into the CAM tab. So as you can see here, we have our ribbon across the top. Once you install the Inventor HSM, it's just another tab inside the software. So the first thing we're going to do is that job setup I spoke of. Job setup is where we're going to define which part we're working with, the size of the stock, and redefine our work coordinate system. As you can see down in the bottom left of my viewing window, the model was done with the Z pointing towards the front of the vise. Well, when we get to the machining, we want that Z to be pointing up towards the spindle. So first thing to do is select which model we're working with. So I'm going to choose model in the browser and choose that part file. As soon as I do that, you see the yellow box which represents our stock size shrinks down to that part file. Next thing I want to do is reorient my work coordinate system for the machining. They made it really easy in the software. Simply select the stem or the shaft of the z-axis and then pick an edge that you want it parallel to or a surface anywhere in the model that you want it perpendicular to. So I'll just select select the top face here and it rotates my Z towards the spindle. You can do the same thing with the Z or X or Z or X or Y. Select the stem and pick an edge you want it parallel to or a surface you want it perpendicular to. Then you, if you wanted to flip those, you could also click the arrowhead and that will flip your X and Y coordinates or the Z. So once you get that in the correct orientation, then you want to move that 000, zero, zero point. You can select the triad, the zero, 00 point here. And as soon as I select it, you'll notice the midpoints and the edges and the surfaces become selectable on the stock. That's because my option in the browser over here says stock box point. You can also do uh, model origin, um, model box point. So you can use different points off your model. Or you could do selected point, and then virtually you could select any um, node, circle face, anywhere in the software. So I've started to see a lot of customers using a fixed point on your solid jaw of your fixture because then you could reference the same point for all your jobs. So I'm going to place that there. Go to the stock tab. This is where we're going to define what size our stock is. So we've got five different options here, fixed and relative box size, fixed and relative cylinder size, and then from solid. The difference between fixed and relative Fixed would be entering your X, Y, and Z dimensions of your stock, whereas relative is relative to the model. So you can see the stock size shrinks to the outer limits of the model, and then we're just adding on to the extents of it. So if I wanted to have something to grab onto, I can put my .375 onto the bottom of the model, and you can see that stock grow as soon as I type that in. With those dimensions, you can see what the, or with those offsets, you can see what the true dimensions will be for your stock based off the model size. If you wanted to, you could round those up, make them a little easier for the machines to cut to. Once that's inputted, you can go on. The one thing I wanted to point out also is from solid. From solid means you can actually use a multi-body modeling or in an assembly environment, you can actually model up the stock that you're starting with. So great for people working off of castings. You can have your casting as your stock and then machine to your finished model. Then finally, the post process tab. This is where we can enter name and number for, for the uh, program. And we can also define which work coordinate system offset we're going to use on the machine. So 0 and 1 are going to be your G54. If you guys have multiple vice setups in your mill, you can post out. You know, if you have four mill set up, you can put four in there. That will post out your code for machining all those work coordinate system offsets. And you can even preserve those by order, operation, or tool. So if I do it by tool, that's going to optimize the post to, you know, if we're going to face material off on this one, it would face off all four 
job setups before it would switch to an end mill and clean out the pockets. But for this one, we're just going to do one, and we'll just use the G54. So let's OK that, and you can see here the right-click menu, the marking menu of Inventor is in the interface as well. So we have our job set up. Now we're ready to start adding our operations. The first one I'm going to do is face off the material on the top as we left. 40,000 is the material above the part. So I'm going to select the facing operation. And I want to point out here in the browser we see it changes to the facing operation. And we have five different tabs on the top. So tool, geometry, heights, passes, and linking. Those are the same five tabs that you're going to see for every operation in the software. So that made it really easy. Once you, know, once you know where to go for one operation, you're going to know where to go for all the other operations as well. And the first thing we're always going to do is select our tool. So I'm going to come into the tool library. And right now you can see I have four tools set up for this example. I actually just copied and pasted those into my open document of this part file, of this assembly. So um, back to that where I was talking about this being one file and easy for file management. There is no importing or exporting, so everything's done on, on this assembly. So even the tools, once you use them, are saved directly into that file. So if you need to share it between computers, those tools go with it. Um, but you can see there's a bunch of different libraries that come with the software as well. So you can simply go in there, and there's search folders in here. You can go by type, go to flat mill, be rend mills, and there's a bunch of different ones in there. And I encourage you, once you get using the software, you can just drag and drop those into your own library so you're not having to search through a bunch of different ones. But for this example, Nick, I have a I'm quick question. My... Yes. Um, it's from Caesar Rulier. He said, is there a clash detection against the vice or any pins modeled, et cetera? Yes, yes. Once we get to the uh, post-processing, or the, sorry, once we get to the simulation, we'll be able to verify between the tool holder, the tool, the vice, any fixtures that you have in there, as well as the um, current, the model that you're machining to. So there will be collision detection between all those. Um, but for the facing operation, we're going to use a one and three quarter inch face mill. If you need to create a tool, they made that really easy as well. Just do new mill tool, choose the type of tool that you're creating, and you can see the inputs change depending on the type of tool. So we selected our face mill. And there is default feeds and speeds on each tool, but you can also override them for any operation. And for this operation, I'm going to switch to the geometry tab. You can see there's a yellow box there representing the stock size that we're starting with. I'm going to use the software defaults and just right-click and OK this operation. By default, a facing operation looks at the size of the tool, the diameter of the tool, the width of the stock that you're machining, and it's going to create your tool path. So it's going to come in, lead out, or lead in outside the stock, and then make the number of passes necessary to face off that material. And it's always going to go down to the top of the model for facing operation. If you needed to, you can go in there and edit to create a different step over or create multiple step downs, have a finishing pass. But with the default to the software, which I think they did a great job with, that's what you would get. And as you're creating operations, if you ever want to just verify visually, you can select that operation, go up to simulate. And here I'm just going to turn on the stock and my tool path the to tail. And just go ahead and play that out. So here you can just get a quick rundown of that operation by itself. And at the end, we'll go through and you'll see a simulation of the entire job. So that was the facing operation. The next thing I want to do is rough out these three pockets. So in here we have a roughing high-speed roughing strategy called adaptive clearing. For those of you familiar with high-speed roughing operations, the way it works is we use the same speed and feed throughout the operation, but we're taking shallow passes controlled by what we call an optimal load. So optimal load is going to be kind of like your step over, but the software is smart enough. It takes into account, you know, when you get in the corners, it's going to take shallower passes because there's more surface area on the cutter. So with this, we're taking shallow passes, but we're able to use the full length of the flute. I like to think of it as cutting really tall grass. You can use the full width of the lawnmower deck and set it up really high and do a pass, come back, move it down a little bit, go do another pass. That would be like your traditional milling. With the adaptive clearing, we're 
keeping the lawnmower all the way down to where we want to cut it to, and we're just taking a shallow pass into the side of the lawnmower so it doesn't get bogged down. So we're just pushing it through really quickly. So the way to do that operation, again, we're just going to come into the tool library and select our tool. In this case, we've got a quarter inch end mill. And you notice on the passes tab it was 0.7. Now that optimal load has changed down to 0.1. So there's an equation built into there off of the diameter of the tool. And the geometry tab is where we're going to tell what we want to cut. So I'm going to just go in here and select the three pockets. You can select edges or pockets. And then the passes tab, I just want to point out, since this is a roughing operation, stock to leave is automatically checked, and we're leaving behind 10,000 of material on the uh, sides of the pocket and the bottom of the pocket. And you'll notice there as I hover over different things in the software, there's really good tool tips that explain what it's looking for. So with those defaults, I'm going to right click and OK that. This is a roughing strategy, so we're going to helix down to the bottom of the pocket. Once it gets down to the bottom of the pocket, based off of that optimal load, it's going to helix outwards based off of that. And you can see here, once we get into the corner, there's more surface area on the tool. So it's actually taking shallower passes. It's going to prolong the life of your tool. And if you actually hear this being ran, it's just a smooth sound. There's no change in the pitch as you're cutting through. It's just a constant sound. If any of you were on early enough, that video that I had playing at the beginning, that was adaptive clearing. So now I want to rush Nick, out. two questions. To that part. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, come from Caesar again. Are you able to compare compare the solid model against the resulting geometry to assess how true or how close you are to milling operations um, before yes, you got to the model piece? And then can you model yes, define have. custom tool profiles? Great question. Yes, we can verify um, between the model and what we've machined, and we'll take a look at that. And in the tool library. If you want to model up your own tool, you can do what we call a form mill and import an actual CAD file of the tool itself. So you're not limited to the options here. You can actually just create one and use that as well. Good question. <clears throat> so we did a roughing on the inside of the part. Now I'm just going to duplicate that by right clicking and go to duplicate. And now we're going to rough the outside of the part. So I'm just going to right-click and edit that. So that carried over my tool. I'm just going to clear my pocket selections and select the outside edge of the part. And you notice here we get an arrow representing which direction we're going to be cutting and which side of that line we're going to cut on. So it's smart enough to recognize we want to cut outside the part even though it's looking for a pocket selection. And I selected the outside edge. And if I rotate this model, you'll notice that's not the true bottom of the part. There's a chamfered edge there. So. Um, the tab we haven't looked at yet, Heights, defines where our tool cuts. So you can see things such as our clearance height, our retract height, our top height, and then our bottom height. So bottom height right now is going by selected contours. And I think most machines would agree we'd want to cut past the bottom apart. So that way when we flip it over, we don't have to cut on the side anymore, and we're not left with the knife edge behind. So I'm going to change that from selected contours to model bottom. You notice the plane jumps in there, and we can just simply click and drag that below the part now. So we can machine this a little bit past it. So any of these planes that you see in here, you can click and drag them around on your screen, enter an offset in there. It made it real user friendly. So let's OK and OK that operation, and there's a roughly on the outside. And you can see the yellow lines here representing the lifts because we're always cutting and climbing on. Now I want to come through and clean up with a finishing pass on the inside using our 2D pocket operation. But instead of starting from scratch on that operation, I can actually carry over my selections on the pockets from one operation into another. So I'm going to go and right click, create derived operation, 2D milling, and 2D pocket. So we started a new operation of 2D pocket. It carried over my tool. It carried over my pocket selections. On the passes tab, I do want to uncheck stock to leave, because I'm making this a finishing operation. And I'm going to check finishing passes. As soon as I check finishing passes, you'll notice in our compensation type becomes selectable. So here's where you can turn on in control or where. And that would post out your G41 or 42 code. And the last thing is your linking tab. 
we haven't looked at this one, but this is how you enter and your lead, how you enter the material, where you enter the material, and your transitions. So if you want your lead in, lead outs turned on, this is where that would be. Your pre-built positions or entry positions, you can select different points in the model if you wanted to change where it started the, the tool path. And the thing I wanted to show you is the ramping. This is how we enter the material. Right now it carried over that helix from the previous operation. I don't want a helix down because it would be cutting air to the bottom of the pocket, so I'm going to change that from helix to plunge. And let's look at that one. So there's the finishing on the inside pocket, and you can see because of cutter compensation, there's that little linking move because we're working with the outside of the tool rather than the center of the tool. And then I want to do the same thing on the outside of the part. Um, I need a finishing pass on there, so I'm going to derive from this operation into 2D contour operation. So nice thing about this, we carried over that pocket selection, but it also carried over my heights. So I don't need to come in there and change how low we're going to cut on that part. And on the passes tab, I can turn on cutter compensation. And remember this is a 2D operation, two and a half axis milling you can also ramp around the part at a two degree angle. So that would be a three axis movement, but it's limited to helixing or ramping like this. So we'll okay that one. There's our finishing on the outside. Then the last thing we have left is the chamfer on the edge of the part and drilling the holes. So at this point, let's just take a quick look at the simulation. If I select the setup and simulate, I can go ahead and play that out. And I can turn on stop on collision. Right now it already ran through a collision detection. So we see none there between the model, the tool, the tool holder, and the fixed ring. And you can see your X, Y, and Z real-time coordinates in here as well as um, the name of the operation and how much time it's going to take and approximately how much of the job that percentage-wise that that job is going to take as well. And then the last tab statistics shows us approximate machining time for the entire job not taking into account our machine because we haven't set that up yet, so it doesn't know how fast your tool changes are, but it gets you pretty close. On the display tab, this is where that question came into play. We can do show part comparison. And so this number of intervals is number of colors. I'm just going to do one to make it obvious. And point one. So once it's finished, you'll see the model do a little calculation and change colors here. I'm just going to speed this up a little bit. So here's the finishing on the inside of the part. And once it finishes on the outside of the part, we can see the colors change in the part. So we have gray and blue areas. So this is where that show part comparison comes into play. Blue represents material that still needs to be removed, whereas red, if we had any red, that would mean that we had a collision or we removed material from what was modeled. If I go to the Info tab, here where it says Distance Unavailable, as I hover over the model, it will tell me how much material is left behind. So you can see right now it's at zero inches on the bottom of that pocket. If I go to the surface over here, we still have 174,000 to remove. So that would be done on the next operation or job setup when you flip the part over and machine that material off. So that's your part comparison. So what we get from this is we still need to drill the holes and chamfer the top edge of the part. So let's close that, come into a drilling operation. Here I'm going to pick a tool. I got a 152 drill bit. And on the geometry tab, this time we're not looking for um, pockets, we're looking for hole faces. So I'm going to select the face of one hole. And as soon as I do that, I can check the select same diameter box and it's going to find all the other holes that are that size. And if you're wondering what size it is while you're in here, you don't have to get out and go measure it. I can actually just hover over the hole. And you can see down in the bottom left corner of my screen right now, it shows me the diameter of that hole. And uh, with those, you can go to the Heights tab. So right now, it's going to the whole bottom. And I wanted to point out that hole actually has a chamfer on the bottom of the hole. So the whole bottom doesn't go all the way through the part as it's modeled. But there is a box here to drill tip to the bottom. This ensures that we get that tip all the way through the bottom of the hole. So that when we flip it over, we're not left with a cone inside there. 
And I have a 20,000 breakthrough depth as a default for my software. Anytime you want to change an input box on the software, you can right click and make that a default. So they've made the, the software very customizable. Anytime you want to change an operation, you can just type it in there and make that a default. That's going to save it for the next time you do that operation. If you want to reset back to the software defaults, you can just reset back to that as well. If you ever have a equation in one of these boxes, like our step over is based off the diameter of the tool, you can go in there to edit expression and actually type in you know, parameters like tool diameter times 20 thousandths if you wanted that to be an expression inside there as well. On the drilling operation, the last thing we want to take a look at is the cycle. Here's where you can define what is boring, drilling, tapping. For this operation, we're going to do deep drilling, full retract. This would be a peck drilling cycle. It's going to come down, pull back up, clean the chips out, and go back through pecking all the way down. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go ahead and OK that one. And I want to follow that up and deburr the top of those holes with a chamfer. So I'm going to do a drill again, pick my quarter inch 45 degree chamfer tool. Move to the geometry tab, select hole faces. This time I'm going to actually select the chamfer. Software is smart enough to recognize, and you can see a preview there of the chamfer going inside the, of the part. But the software recognizes that we have a chamfer tool and that's a chamfered surface. It's automatically going to calculate how far that tool needs to come down to create that chamfer. So we don't need to make any changes on the heights. And cycle, I'm just going to use the drilling rapid out as well. Oh, I do want to check the box for select same diameter so it picks up all those other chamfers as well. OK, that one. And last but not least, we're going to chamfer the outside edge, top edge of the part. I'm going to do that with 2D contour. Our tool is carried over from the previous operation, so we have our 45 degree chamfer. On the geometry tab, I'm going to select the bottom edge of the pockets. So with the bottom edge of the pockets, it will know to follow that around for the chamfer. And you'll notice, because we have a chamfer tool, if we look at the Passes tab, the box for chamfer is automatically checked for us. So here we have two input boxes. We have a chamfer width and a chamfer tip offset. If you didn't model up the chamfer like we have here, you could actually select sharp corners and just enter a chamfer width for how much you want that cutter to engage into the material. And then another software default I put in here was 50 thousandths for chamfer tip offset. That's going to slide our cutter down so we're cutting on the middle of this cutting tool rather than the tip of the cutting tool so we don't burn that chamfer tool up real quick. So I just typed in 50 thou and made that a default for myself. So let's go ahead and OK that one. And there is our chamfering operation. And just to show you, I can simulate that operation by itself. I'm just going to turn off the stock real quick and select the point in the software or inside the tool path so you can see that tool has been slid down. We're cutting on the meaty part of the cutter, not the tip of the tool. OK? So at this point, we'd run through simulation again. And I'm just going to kind of jump through. We've seen most of these operations already. So I'm going to turn the stock back on. I turn the tool path to tail usually, because right now it's really busy with all the different lines in there and play that out. So I can speed this up. Here's our roughing of the inside of the part, roughing of the outside of the part, finishing operation on the inside, finishing on the outside. Then we got our pectoring cycle to draw up those holes. And then we're going to come through and chamfer those and chamfer the top edges apart. Then it does its little calculation. It should. There it goes. So now we can see that all those blue marks for the holes have disappeared as well as the chamfer. And you'll see we do have some blue lines here on the sides of the pocket. We did remove that. I believe what that is is the software taking into account 
I haven't verified this with the development team, but I'm, I'm thinking that that is taking into account the flux from the tool as it's going around the side edge of that pocket. So that's why you're seeing just a little bit of blue left behind in different spots on there. Um, once we're done, it'd be great, or we're going to send out a setup sheet to the operator of the machine so we can select the job setup and go to setup sheet. This will open up in your web browser. You can also open it up in Excel, but it will post or give you an image of the file, the stock size that you're starting with, where that file is located, and then it breaks down each operation. So you can see here which tool to load and which tool holder. We get a breakdown of the operations, maximum, minimum, Z heights. So you can see before you even load it if there's going to be any collisions or anything like that. It's just another good verification. So you can see all those, and we can customize that and, and condense it down to just each tool or each operation. And let's say at this point the customer calls up and wants to make some changes to the model. With this being the integrated CAD and CAM, we can edit that part directly in place. So I'm just going to double click that part, it takes us into edit mode, and let's just change our overall length from two and a half to three and a half. And I have a hole pattern for these holes. So right now we have five. Let's change that. Maybe they only need three holes to hold this part down. So we change the hole pattern to three. OK that. And that was a mirrored feature, so it updates on both sides. We'll go ahead and finish that edit. It's going to jump back into the cam environment. And you notice I have some red X's here on the, the operations. All I need to do is select the setup and generate. And it's going to run through, updates my stock size to the model, and updates each of the operations to that new geometry. So once that's done, and I actually still have red X here. Looks like that one. There we go. So we have our operations ready to go now. Now we're ready to post process. So the way to post process works is you select the setup. If you wanted to post that one operation by itself, you could select that as well. But we want to do all the operations at once, so we're going to go post process. Opens up a dialog box for post processing. And there's a few parameters down below here that you can change inside the dialog menu. But this is, as I said, JavaScript language, so you can virtually change anything you want. We can reorder things. We can change where your coolant comes on. Um, we have a full post processing team with Autodesk that does that for you. And so things like your preload tool, whether you have a swing arm or an umbrella tool changer, you can turn that on and off. And those are sticky, so if you select one, it's going to be that way the next time you open the software. So we're ready to post. Give it a name, location, save that, and this will open up inside that Simco editor, or as they call it in the software, the Inventor HSM editor. So here you can see color-coded uh, high-speed movements, tool changes, things of that nature. There's really good navigation tools in here as well, so I can switch around to different tools. Um, add or turn off line numbers. You can transmit out to your machine if you have that set up for yourself. You can even come in here and do a back plot and turn on your back plot window and run through a simulation based off the of G-code. So I'm just holding the down arrow right now. And you could go through line by line of simulation off of that as well. Another good verification. So you'd save that to your thumb drive or send it out to your machine and you'd be ready to machine. So uh, that was all done with the 2D milling operation, which if you have Inventor, that's a, a free plugin. But the 3D milling package is where you really see the power of the software. Because with 2D milling, each of these operations, we had to come in here and select, you know, we had to select the outside edge of the part. We had to select the bottom of the pocket or select the holes. With the 3D milling operations, the software is looking at the model as a whole. So I have a 3D part here, which already has a job set up done on it. So you can see we have some material above the parting line, and we have a cavity down inside. So for this operation, if I do adaptive clearing with the 3D strategy, <clears throat> we no longer have to select a hole or a pocket. What we're doing this time is I come into the tool library. I'm going to use this 3 8 inch 25 thou radius bullnose end mill, move to the geometry tab. 
and machine boundary is set to none. So rather than looking for pocket selections, the 3D operations are looking for a boundary, and it's going to look at the model as a whole and machine to that. So if I just right click with our defaults in this, it's going to run through, calculate, roughing all that material out with my 3D cinch tool. And again, that's a roughing strategy, so we're leaving behind 10,000 of material on the bottoms and the sides of all the surfaces. And these take just a little bit longer to calculate. So while it's running, you can actually start another operation. If I know, there we go. So here, you can see it's just going to come through and rough out. Using that high-speed roughing operation, it's going to rough out all the material. It doesn't go down inside like this area right here because the tool is too big to fit inside there. So it looks at the model as a whole and machines out what it can with that tool. In fact. It does rust machine operations as well, so maybe I want to follow that up with a smaller tool. So I'll come in here and select like a, uh, let's go with the eighth inch bullnose end mill. I'll select that, go to the geometry tab. I'm going to use the same machining boundary, except this time I'm going to change it from stock setup to from previous operations. So now it knows as it's calculating for this, it knows what's been removed from that previous operation, and it knows what's left behind inside my stock. So it's always aware of the stock in process, and it's going to calculate what can be removed with that smaller tool. So this could really speed up your machine process, get rid of the big stuff with your bigger tool, and then come back through and follow it up, and have to remove the minimal amount with your smaller tool. While that's going, I can calculate. I know I need a finishing pass on the parting line here. So I can come into like a parallel operation. I'll use a quarter inch ball for this operation. And the geometry tab, again, it's looking for a boundary, but you can also do selections to minimize that. So I want a selection for the outside of the part and the inside of the part pocket. So what that tells me is it's going to machine in between those two selections. And the passes tab, again, this is where you change how you're going to cut the part. So you can change things like your step over, give it a real nice fine finish. I'm going to do 20 thousandths from the step over. There's your finishing pass. You could change the angle for that if you wanted to. But that would be your finishing pass for the party line. We could see right here the adaptive six finished. So that was your follow-up roughing strategy with the smaller tool. And the last thing I would want is just a finishing operation for the inside pocket. I'd use something like scallop or morph spiral. Uh, scallop is a good finishing strategy. It, it runs off of the outside profile that you select for your geometry, and it's just going to machine inwards using the same step over throughout. So let's right-click and OK that one. So here we have roughing with the 3 8 inch tool, roughing with the 1 8 inch tool. We've got a finishing pass on the parting line, and then we have a finishing pass on the inside. And I'd probably actually make that a little bit finer step over. But you can see the idea. Now, one of the really neat things to do with the software, as you mentioned, somebody asked the question of tool collisions. Well, I know that it's going to be a collision here with the second operation. Before I even start the simulation, right now it's calculating on the info tab. You can see it running through. Uh, detection, uh, I can't talk. Detected collisions, and you can see out here we get some red lines. So before I even start the simulation, I know I'm going to have issues. So I can just jump right to that point in time, and here I can see. I got a collision between the tool holder and the outside of the part. So my tool offset is not far enough outside the tool to machine down inside that pocket. So I could play games of guessing and you know and try and measure that of how far that tool needs to be offset outside the tool holder to machine that pocket. But it did it built in a really neat um, feature in here. And I know it's going to do the same thing with a scallop, but you can go into that operation and turn on shaft and tool holder detection. And now you can automatically detect the tool length. So I can come in here and say use the holder 
and I want a clearance of 200 thousandths between the holder and my part file. So this will automatically calculate and update my tool offset outside the holder so that you don't have a collision detection. So again, that would run through, and then you can go and verify that again, and you'd see there will be a yellow check mark over this operation when I'm done, and it'll say it has updated my tool length. So while that's going, uh, Patrick, do we have any other questions pop up? We're coming on eight minutes left. Yes, um, it was asked, are you able to use a 2D sketch to program engraving and profiling pass? Um, sometimes parts are not so simple that you almost do not need to model them to mill them. Yes, you can use, with this being integrated, you can use sketches and you can also use 3D models. So if you had just a 2D sketch of things, you could select that for like contour profiles or even pockets. You could select the geometry of what you want the pocket to be and just change the depth of it based on that height tab. Good question. You can also, um, you know, some machines can't machine because their tables are large enough to machine the entire job. You can also use sketches to, you know, if I do a box sketch over half of this part, I could limit to only machine half the part, and then I could do another setup and slide the part over and machine the other half of the part. So you could use sketches for multiple um, uses. Good question. Uh, that job finished, so you can see we have a yellow check mark here, so I can right click and go to show log, and you can see here the tool length has been updated from 5 eighths to 1.03176 to ensure that the holder does not collide with the part. So I can go back into my tool library for that operation, and let's just edit that tool, and you'll see it automatically updated that body length for us, so now we're not going to have a collision there. Any other questions, Patrick? That is it for now, sir. Awesome. Well, hopefully that gives you guys a better understanding of the power of CAD and CAM and one integrated solution. Um, I will pull up my our contact information here again, Patrick, so we can jot that stuff down if anybody needs to get a hold of us for questions. And if you don't have anything else, that was all I had for today. Well, great. Hopefully it worked out for everybody. Um, like I said, there's no other questions, so I think we're good, Nick. Um, just some to wrap it up, uh, if you haven't already, search the Live Lab Learning on Facebook and like our page to receive the latest information and special offers. Um, when you visit our website, livelablearning.com, there is a complete schedule of upcoming training and future informational webinars and software updates. Again, we thank you for joining us today. We hope you found this information uh, helpful and uh, more importantly, help to your business. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, at my contact or Nick, and we both would be more than happy to help you guys out. But other than that, you all have a good day. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys.